All right, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Sarah Tim. I am the manager of education here at Maine Maritime Museum. I wanna welcome you to Unfurl, a symposium for undertold maritime voices. So I'm very honored to open uh, the symposium today that provides a platform for more inclusive stories. So on behalf of the museum, I want to acknowledge and apologize for the hate speech that disrupted our virtual gathering this past week. Uh, the display of callous ignorance reaffirms the urgency and the critical need for diversifying the stories that we tell, but also providing a platform for those voices who are too often silenced. I want to extend a heartfelt thank you and graciousness and kindness of our speakers whose shared commitment to persevere is helping us make this possible today. I also wanna thank our audience, both new and especially returning for your support of today's symposium. When considering how to adapt my opening remarks for our regathering, I landed on the important symbolism of standing firm to the story I was hoping to share in face of those wanting to disrupt it. So for those of you who are joining us again, thank you. The following will be a retelling of my opening remarks from last week, but the content of which bears repeating. So Maine Maritime Museum, like many museums and cultural institutions recently, has taken a step back. A step back from our own points of view, assumptions and framework that have shaped the stories we tell. How can we reconsider what is maritime and where is Maine? Traditionally viewed as an epicenter of shipbuilding, but located on land and waters that have long belonged to the Wabanaki and whose mariners increasingly grew more global, not local. To illustrate this reassessment and prime our discussions over the next two hours, I want to share a very well-known image amongst those familiar with Maine Maritime Museum. So this photograph is of the launch of the schooner Wyoming in 1909, billed then and now as the largest wooden sailing vessel built in North America. It was and still is a symbol of Maine's prosperity and ingenuity, a narrative that Maine Maritime Museum amplifies within our galleries. But is this the whole story? Who have we left out of the frame? When redoing a gallery exhibit, we took a second look in our archives with new questions. We found in plain sight, but not yet seen, was this photo of the Wyoming crew from the Captain W.J.L. Parker collection. We discovered that our own interest in super superlatives neglected a more inclusive view of maritime Maine. Every individual in this photo has a story to tell. What are we doing to make these stories and stories like them known and accessible? We don't yet know the names of these crew members and we may never know. But we do know the name of Pedro Sparrows, a Black Colombian national seen here in his alien seaman's identification card issued to all foreign seamen arriving in American ports in the 19th century and early 20th century. Barrios lost his life at the age of 29 as a crew member on Wyoming's final voyage, where it sank in a storm off the coast of Massachusetts in 1924. How would Pedro Barrios tell the story of the Wyoming? How should we tell Pedro Barrios' story? These are the questions we should be asking. So today I have the honor of welcoming speakers whose work is dedicated to expanding the stories that we tell. Before I introduce our speakers, I want to acknowledge the hard work of Paul Fuller, our assistant curator and my co-symposiarch helping organize this event. And I want to thank our symposium sponsors, Albert Reed and Thelma Walker, whose support enables us to come every year together and share ideas and scholarship connected to maritime Maine. So a quick review of symposium protocol. If you have a question uh, during 
our presenters' presentations. Um, because we are in a webinar format, um, you will need to enter them into the question or Q&A box down and below. Presenters um, will see these questions, our host will be monitoring these questions, and we will refer to them when it comes time uh, to engage in conversation. So today we are hearing from three presenters. First up will be uh, Dr. Kim Long. We are going to wait for Chris Newell to maybe perhaps um, present in the last spot. So we're going to start with Dr. Kim, uh, Chris, sorry, excuse me, Kim Long, who is a scholar in residence for digital and cultural engagement in the Gibbs Museum in Charleston, South Carolina. She's also the executive director of the Low Country Rice Culture Project, and she'll share her work on the coastal foodways and African-American maritime heritage. She'll be followed by Patrick Burroughs, a historian and retired university administrator who will introduce us to John Brown of Westworm, a black leader forged in Maine. So Dr. Long, I invite you to begin sharing your screen. Thank you so much. Let me get the um, presentation up and uh, we will begin. I'm happy to be here and um, um, the images, I wanna first talk about the images I am sharing today represent the glorious art of internationally acclaimed artist, Jonathan Green. And uh, Jonathan is the first classically trained artists of Gullah descent in America and, and in the world, actually. And he's also the founder of the Low Country Rice Culture Project. His career of 40 plus years has been spent documenting the um, people, Gullah Geechee people in the Low Country. So he paints in series and each series represents um, a cultural anthropology uh, of, of the people within the Low Country. And I live in the Low Country in Charleston, South Carolina, but um, interested in the Eastern um, American seaboard as it relates to um, African American maritime heritage. So today um, I will talk about coastal foodways and African American maritime heritage. I will start with um, the West Coast of Africa. The West Coast of Africa was targeted in the transatlantic slave trade in a large part due to the human resources and brain trust necessary to cultivate the newly discovered cash crop of rice. The African species of rice was cultivated long before Europeans arrived in the continent. The Dola, a population of ancient rice growing peoples living in the swampy coastal areas of Casamance in southern Senegal, were of particular interest to Europeans seeking labor and enterprise to embark on this new enterprise of rice. The European production to, uh, I'm sorry, introduction to rice growing began when the first Portuguese reached the West African coast and witnessed the cultivation of rice in the flood plains and marshes of the upper Guinea coast. In their accounts spanning the second half of the 15th century and all of the 16th century, they mentioned the vast fields planted in rice by the local inhabitants and emphasized the important role this cereal played in the native diet. The first Portuguese observers greatly admired the native rice growing technology because it involved biking, transporting, and other intensive practices. Nearly a century was to pass before we have another detailed account of local rice growing practices. Since this so-called age of discovery, rice has been entwined with the history of transatlantic slavery, which lasted from the mid 
15th century to the last quarter of the 19th century. Over 400 years, near, for over 400 years, nearly 13 million African youth were kidnapped and imprisoned on European slave ships bound for the Americas. Once landed, the survivors were sold as free labor to work colonial mines and plantations. Many had experience growing rice. African rice was on board during enslavement voyages. As slave ships plied the West African coast, their captains purchased rice in bulk to feed their captives during the weeks long middle passage. Eventually, unmilled seed rice found its way from ship's larders into the hands of New World Africans who planted it in their provision gardens or maroon hideaways. By the end of the 17th century, plantation owners in Carolina and later Brazil were beginning to cultivate rice in response to rising demand from Europe. They grew African rice at first, acquired as leftover slave ship provisions, and were certainly tutored by the enslaved Africans already proficient at growing rice. The development of rice as a lucrative export crop cultivated on a, max, on a massive scale in the tropical and semi-tropical swamps and tide water estuaries of the Americas is also a story of African agency and know-how. Nearly all the technologies employed on New World rice plantations bear African antecedents from the irrigation systems that made fill, fills productive to the milling and winnowing of, of grain by African female laborers wielding traditional African tools. What's this? Uh, okay. The recovery of African rice history dispels long held beliefs that Africans contributed little to the global intellectual and innovative table and added nothing more than muscle to the agricultural history of the Americas. It upends the myth that they only provided labor existing as less than human hands that uncomprehendingly carried out slaveholder directives. Rice history has directed scholars to new geographical spaces, such as the provision gardens of the enslaved, which contained a wealth of other foods and plants secretive from Africa. Enslaved Africans also made contributions to the colonies in archeology, span botany, geography, linguistics, and genomics, not least it gives to slavery's victims a voice rarely heard in traditional sources. There were other African crop grown crops that travel on the slave ships with those enslaved. Most often foods such as okra, rice, and kidney and lima beans accompanied them. The food was to ensure that the enslaved persons were able to eat while traveling to their new way of life. There were also many other crops that traveled as well, such as watermelon, yams, guinea melon, millet, and sesame. Many of these crops today can still be found in many kitchens around America. Additionally, fish and other seafood became diet staples in the low country as it was along the Atlantic seaboard. The crop soon became not only eaten by Africans, but white Americans as well. But none of the other trans 
planted foods except rice became as centric to the incredible wealth which developed in the Southern Low Country, United States, particularly Charleston, South Carolina, which became the wealthiest city in the United States for a hundred years from profits based on rice produced from the free labor of enslaved Africans and African-Americans. The relationship of rice growing in the low country coastal areas to maritime history and culture is rarely explored, especially as it relates to the economics of the Atlantic world and the integrated livelihoods and foodways of the people living in the 13 coastal colonies pre-Civil War. From the 1730s, to the early 1800s, the golden age of, of deep water sailing ships, South Carolina's plantation economy thrived on maritime global trade and the hundreds of ocean-borne vessels that docked in Charleston each year to load rice and cotton for European markets. International trade spawned the wealth that built the grand historic homes and gardens of Charleston, Beaufort, and Georgetown. Charleston and the Low Country grew rich in the 18th century, largely due to favorable trade winds in the North Atlantic Basin. If a ship were aimed for New York or Boston or Philadelphia, the vessel might stop at Charleston to take on food and supplies or load and unload cargo. Charleston was a primary um, at North American destination for English ships. After trading in Charleston, a ship would sail up to Cape Hatteras before veering Northeast across the Atlantic to Europe. This transatlantic route, historian George C. Rogers, pointed out was a great circle and Charleston was on its Western edge. By the 1720s, the slave trade from Africa to Carolina also flourished. European ships traveled to West Africa where they picked up slaves and sailed for the new world. From 1716, to 1807, the holy city as Charleston is known, was the port of entry for an estimated 120,000 or more slaves. About 22% of all slaves legally brought into the North America. Ships from South Carolina carried rice, cotton, and other goods back to Europe. During the antebellum era, Charleston Mar Charleston's maritime trade spawned demand for slave um, artisans, including rope makers, carpenters, and shipwrights. In the years before the Atlantic Revolution, Charleston was the fourth largest city in British North America, but easily the richest. Its wealth dominated the rest of the raw Southern outback with perhaps the exception of Virginia. Visitors were awed by the city's glittering society. South Carolina's maritime traders found dramatic success in the early 18th century after low country settlers discovered their most profitable cash crop, rice. The demand for South Carolina rice was greatest in Northern Europe. Most Americans were not rice consumers. So Carolina gold rice was produced for overseas markets. By the 1720s, more than half of the value of all of the colonies exports came from the rice trade. A decade later, 
500 deep sea vessels a year sailed into Charleston's port to trade. In 1739, 18 privately owned wharves had been built from Bay Street into the Cooper River to serve the shipping industry. Charleston dominated the Southern coast politically and economically. Low country South Carolina was not a complete maritime society like coastal Massachusetts, Maine, Rhode Island, and Connecticut. Most South Carolinians looked inland and not to sea. In the Northeast, if you lived near the coast, your livelihood was connected to the water. Charleston was blessed with an excellent harbor that South Carolinians built and invested in very few seagoing vessels. Instead, they depended on ships owned by Londoners or Bostonians. New Englanders increasingly dominated American shipbuilding and maritime investing. Bostonians built vessel shares in the way that modern investors by corporate stock share. Settlers needed reliable vessels built for local conditions, quickly realizing that deep draft European ships were impractical in shallow waters behind sea islands in the low country. It was costly and time consuming to saw planks for small European style vessels. So they learned from the Native Americans how to use dugout crafts from the plentiful ball cypress trees along coastal waterways. The dugout was the model T of colonial ships in the low country, especially seemingly uh, everywhere and used for every purpose. By the 1700s, colonialists modified dugout crafts called periaguas to move goods downriver from Native American trading posts, coastal towns. At first, the periagua was a flat bottomed, fairly narrow barge with a hull made from two cypress logs. Four to six men, usually enslaved, hired from their owners, rode the typical periagua. There was a small cabin aft for stowing valuables. Trade goods were covered by tarpaulin. On tidal waters near the coast, periaguas used sails. In the 1760s, boat builders made larger periaguas with live oak framing members and wide pine plank. More than a hundred barrels of, of rice, each weighing about 560 pounds, could be transported by one of the bigger periaguas. The boats and canoes of the Low Country were crewed primarily by in, the enslaved men. Slave watermen enjoyed considerable autonomy from their masters. It, the enslaved were also crew and often captains of plantation-owned vessels that sailed coastal waters. Watermen could stay out of sight of their masters for long periods. Traveling throughout the low country, slave bondsmen made extra money by trading goods with field hands and other plantation slaves. Many large plantations had their own shipyards for vessel construction and repair. By 1800, Charleston was steadily losing maritime trade to other cities. Greater precision in navigation and improved vessels allowed ship captains to sail directly from Europe to New York. Ships no longer had to travel the southerly route via the Caribbean and Charleston. 
the faster transatlantic route between New York and Europe left Charleston out of the loop. Charleston was seen as a terrible port beginning in the 1840s. Its shallow harbor could not accommodate the new transatlantic steamships with the deep drafts. The most sophisticated shipping merchants and technologies were, were found in the North. About 60% of South Carolina's exports had to be sent in the coastwide, coastwise trade to New York, Boston, Philadelphia, and Baltimore, where the major transatlantic lines were located. The least industrialized major city in the United States in the late antebellum years, Charleston, Traveler's Notice, lacked the verb and energy of other seaports. Low country planters held anti-business attitudes with the exception of agricultural commerce. A Southern gentleman made his money in agriculture and owned slaves. A gentleman did not own textile factories, thus benefiting from the South's leading export and hire white workers who could upset the order of a slave society. Rice in the Americas has a racial history and maritime activity is part of the story. Maritime activity moves people and food and changes what and how people cook. And slavery in the Americas had huge maritime elements, shipping captured people, shipping foodstuffs as part of the trade, naval battles with alliances along the race lines all made up these maritime elements. White Europeans had no experience growing or cooking rice. Africans did and were deliberately captured and enslaved to grow rice here. African-American enslaved cooks were given European recipes and then they gave them an African twist. Free Blacks continued this culinary tradition. Then there is a variety of rice that reveals to historians, biologists, and genetics stories of the African diaspora. Few Americans, Black or white, recognize the degree to which early African-American history is a maritime history. W. Jeffrey Bolster shatters the myth that black seafaring in the age of sail was limited to the middle passage. Seafaring was one of the most significant occupations among both enslaved and free black men between 1740 and 1865. Tens, and tens of thousands of black seamen sailed on lofty clippers and modest coasters. They sailed in whalers, warships, and privateers. Some were enslaved, forced to work at sea, but by 1800, most were freedmen seeking liberty and economic opportunity aboard ships. Because of their unusual mobility, Sailors were the eyes and ears to the worlds beyond the limited horizon of Black communities ashore. Sometimes they helped to smuggle slaves to freedom. They were more often a unique conduit for news and information of concern to Blacks. But for all its opportunities, life at sea was very difficult. Blacks actively contributed to the Atlantic maritime culture shared by all seamen, but often they were outsiders within it. The mobility of Black seamen connected the colonies, helping to share important messaging, spiriting away those seeking 
freedom in sharing their various talents in maritime industries. The influence of the sea on historical events on land has become neglected as a field of scholarly inquiry, rarely figuring in terrestrial historical causality. But this neglect is in turn part of a larger contemporary misconception about the past. Most people alive today, particularly those who live inland and experience no direct contact with seaborne trades, have no real concept of how important water transport was to daily life in the United States in the 18th and 19th centuries. Once railroads and motor vehicle traffic reshaped settlement and transportation patterns, people forgot just how vital the sea and waterborne commerce were to the fabric of everyday life in the United States prior to the early decades of the 20th century. Quite simply, coastwise shipping along the Eastern seaboard dominated the American economy until the late 1800s. Almost all personal and business travel of more than a relatively few miles and virtually all shipping of heavy goods was conducted predominantly by water because watercraft offered by far the fastest, cheapest, and most efficient means of transport. Coastals, schooners, sloops, and brigs were workhorses of this eternal trade, internal trade, in which enslaved persons produced raw materials such as cotton and molasses were sh and, and rice, and they were shipped northward to New England and New York factories and northern industrial manufactured goods were shipped south. These items included the finished cotton cloth, iron and steel tools, agricultural machinery, as well as third rate saltfish used as a cheap food for enslaved um, plantations. I am so grateful for the opportunity to share um, this presentation today I'm excited to continue investigating this line of inquiry, and I welcome any questions at this time, if we, if we do have any time allotted. All right, thank you, Dr. Long, so much. Yes, please, if you do have questions, you can enter them into the Q&A field, and we will, the panelists and I, uh, our hosts will see them and we'll, we'll ask them of our speakers. Um, but I do, Dr. Long, have, um, I don't know if it's a question or comment, it lies somewhere in between. Um, this, this importance of connecting kind of hyper-local history, so your, your work down in Charleston, really parsing out the economic connections, both um, with these plantations, but also kind of that, that economic infrastructure among the enslaved as well, that's happening on these waterways, and then connecting that to another hyper-local history up here in Maine. So we often talk about, gosh, downeasters that are taking grains to California or around the world. Um, and I'm just struck by this, so st the stat that I read recently that in 1858 in Charleston, um, on this particular day, 16 of the ships in port, 15 of them were from Maine or, or had Maine owners. Um, so it's just, <laughs> And importance of kind of reconciling these very hyper-local histories and able to kind of be aware of the complexities um, for particular peoples whose histories aren't well known. So I, I would love to hear a little bit more um, if you could speak to this concept of these kind of enslaved captains on, on Charleston's waterways. And, and um, oftentimes we, I think myself, I'm guilty of thinking that the products were produced um, by enslaved uh, peoples and then put on ships and that's done. But there's this whole other culture of enslaved people um, that I wasn't aware of. So I'd love to learn more about that. Well, the plantations themselves, okay. So each plantation was a, a microcosm of a small city. 
where everything was um, internal to the plantation except for production of some goods and of course services. So if you've ever been to Charleston, Charleston is um, the, the downtown area of Charleston is a peninsula and uh, surrounding the peninsula are many islands and inlets and waterways um, and the Cooper and Ashley rivers are the main water arteries and as well as the Atlantic Ocean. The people of Charleston were so arrogant early on that they say the Ashley and the Cooper rivers meet to form the Atlantic Ocean. Um, so this, this rich, uh, fertile marshland with all these inlets, well, they, they provided the transportation system from one plantation to the other. So the enslaved uh, bondsmen were given the latitude to carry these goods and services from one plantation to the other, or perhaps all the way over to the peninsula. Um, as a result, the underground maritime, um, the underground railroad, maritime underground railroad was prevalent because they could secret away people um, um, by water and help them, um, the freedom seekers escape. So long before uh, the train system was developed or other forms of transportation, the waterways were uh, the busy highways for moving for commerce and moving goods and services. That's, that's fascinating. Um, I have so many questions, but I'll save it for the, the panel later. Um, I do want to, we have a, some questions coming in from the Q&A. Um, I think one I'll save for the panel as well, but uh, this next one, uh, do you feel this history is uh, taught in your local school systems? And to follow up with that, um, if not, is there efforts to include it? Um, I don't think that the maritime aspects of the history is, is taught in the local schools. And we're working from the museum's point of view to instill that into the curriculum. I had the opportunity to um, serve as one of the editors for the uh, required social studies textbooks for the state of South Carolina. And we certainly emphasize the maritime attributes in the new textbooks that um, went into classrooms this August. Um, but prior to that, no, there had not been, um, and we're still fledgling in terms of exploring the wartime, uh, the maritime and the, um, the transport, water transportation in terms of commerce in the low country. As, as the history and as I spoke to uh, during my presentation, the, the, um, the planter class looked inland. They didn't think about, they knew water was a necessity to move the goods and, and services, but they didn't see that as their, their money-making uh, asset. And, um, and so that is how history has been perceived around the plantation structures. And, and actually my um, research started with the rice culture and the cultures emanating off the plantations um, as it, as it uh, relates to the influences for contemporary times. But now we're realizing we, cannot, we can't do that without the maritime aspect. And so I think um, post-Civil War, the colonies prior to the Civil War were dependent on one another in terms of how they allocated um, industry and commerce. And um, post-Civil War, um, became this, this um, north and south aspect of commerce. And so um, we're, we're exploring more about that maritime heritage here in the south. Very interesting. Uh, so many more questions. We do have some questions coming into the Q&A. We'll hold those off in the panel where we're going to have a deeper discussion. 
Um, so thank you, Dr. Long. Um, if you don't mind, uh, stop sharing your screen. Um, I'll invite uh, Mr. Newell. Um, if you want to start sharing your screen, we would love to hear your presentation on um, Mar Native Mariners in Maine in uh, the last few centuries. So thank you, uh, Chris Newell. Um, introduction. So he is the current uh, Director of Education at the Algamalt Educational Initiative, former Director of the Ad Museum. Um, so I give it uh, over to you, Mr. Newell. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Sarah. And my apologies to the Maine Maritime Museum for my late arrival. I'm sure as organizers, they were uh, uh, a little freaked out there for a minute. And uh, I'm, I was supposed to be the first presenter. So I thank you so much to Dr. Long for uh, taking uh, that spot for me and uh, allowing me to come in a little late. Um, so yeah, today I will get right into sharing my screen and right into the presentation here. So a lot of what I'm going to be talking about, uh, uh, my particular subject matter is focused on native mariners of the 18th and 19th centuries. And most of it is, most of what I'm presenting is really the research of my fellow uh, Egamal Educational Initiative co-founder, Dr. Jason Mancini, uh, who is the head of Connecticut Humanities and former executive director of the Pequot Museum. Um, my uh, friend, Dr. Mancini, um, you know, as uh, at his time uh, in the research department in the Pequot Museum, uh, really started looking, you know, uh, at kind of a almost a lost century in uh, the southern what we call New England area now, um, you know, of, uh, you know, native lives, um, you know, there's uh, definitely a lot of enumeration, uh, uh, just to backtrack a little bit, I'm gonna be talking about the southern New England area, uh, and Connecticut, um, primarily, and, uh, but it does have ties, you know, definitely to the state of Maine. Um, Connecticut is actually the uh, the first um, area where reservations began. Uh, the precursors were the praying towns that began in, in um, um, uh, Massachusetts, which I'll talk about in a little bit, uh, and then uh, reservations in uh, the 17th century in Connecticut. And so there's a lot of enumeration uh, of or counting of how many uh, Pequots or whatever tribe uh, reservation it was were living, you know, uh, year to year to year. Um, and uh, what they were doing uh, was trying to keep track because they were actually looking for other reasons to take land. Uh, and a lot of records of the uh, basically the able bodied men uh, were missing. You know, there, there's a lot of census that, data where it was just kind of showing a lot of populations of uh, elderly folks. Uh, women or children uh, written very high numbers on the reservation, but men were missing. And, and because of that missing piece of information, um, Dr. Mancini really started to research what was going on here. And he discovered, uh, uh, not discovered, he found uh, a whole lot of information about uh, Pequot life during this time period, uh, and as well as Wampanoag, uh, Shinnecock, Matinecock peoples, you know, all around this region here. Um, and it really involves with uh, life at sea. Uh, and that's one of the reasons why it is so unwritten about, uh, and it, it basically became a lost century for uh, Native peoples in this region here. So uh, just to give you a quick orientation, um, you know, to the territory that I'm talking about here, once again, I'm talking about the Southern New England, what we call today New England, what's known to Wabanaki people is just Wabanaki or uh, the land of the dawn. Uh, and even Wampanoag, uh, the people of the first light, you know, they see themselves as part of this larger cosmology in this geography as the area of the country that first sees sunlight here. So this area we now call the Southern New England area, Massachusetts, Rhode Island, Connecticut, Long Island, uh, sound. Um, you know, these are the overlays of the tribes uh, that historically, uh, you know, occupied these territories here. Um, they, you notice the way the, the boundary lines, there's no boundary lines. There's a lot of overlap going on here because native land usage wasn't dependent upon uh, drawn out fence lines, uh, you know, hard line boundaries and things of that sort. Those are all European concepts that come over later. So uh, native land use patterns often overlapped with one another. How did they keep track of who is who? Um, these tribes in this region were largely matrilineal, which means that if there was an intertribal marriage, say a Narragansett uh, marries uh, a Wampanoag, uh, if the mother is Narragansett, then the child is Narragansett, and the husband would actually move into the wife's people's village, uh, and the um, uh, uh, the transfer of uh, uh, lineality would go over to the mother's side there, and they would trace through the mother's line. Um, so. 
when it comes to the cultures that developed here, they're agricultural, uh, they're hunting, fishing cultures. Uh, most of these coastal cultures that you see here, um, they, the, uh, the, uh, they practice a, a way of life of, of kind of semi-nomadic, uh, I guess you could say, uh, migration where in uh, the summer months, uh, they are farming, uh, fishing along the coastal areas. And then in the winter time, they would break up into smaller family groups and spread themselves out through the inland woodland areas for hunting. Uh, and that served you know, all the purposes you need. Uh, the fishing, uh, farming produced most of the food. The hunting produced food, but also produced materials for clothing uh, and other things. And so, um, you know, there's a yearly cycle of land stewardship that occurs uh, that were developed by the cultures here. Now, after colonization, uh, what we end up with is all of that was native territory, you know, pre-colonization, but post-colonization, uh, by the time we get to the 1800s, um, you know, we're talking very much it looking not much different than you see here with the, um, the colonies and then later the states of Massachusetts, Rhode Island, Connecticut, um, you know, hardline boundaries that are uh, drawn there. Uh, native territories, as you can see, are described or communities are described, uh, and they're just kind of little pockmarked uh, spots here. Uh, there was a, a, a very vast uh, and rapid amount of dispossession of native lands. Uh, you know, there was uh, basically uh, the English who were uh, oversettling the area uh, basically had a, a belief system that if uh, human beings were not what they called doing improving the land, which meant cutting down the trees, planting crops, building fences, raising cows, chickens, and pigs, um, then uh, they had no legal right uh, to territory. It was, it was a very dehumanizing way of thinking about native peoples, even though native peoples did improve the land in, in very great ways uh, and stewarded it, uh, you know, and uh, did a lot, quite a lot of work so it would produce everything that they needed. Um, the English did not see it that way. And so, uh, you know, when the English colonized, they uh, take over and dispossess native land, uh, well over 11 million acres uh, in, in a, a large part of it in about a 40 year period. Um, so native peoples uh, after this, I mean, there's a lot of uh, destruction of, uh, uh, or loss of population, uh, primarily through disease. It starts in the 16th century, it, it climbs through the, the 17th century, uh, and it continues into the 18th century. But then there's also uh, aggressive wars. The first war of aggression against native people was the Pequot War, which happened in uh, 1636 to 1638. Uh, and it was the English uh, taking on the Pequots with the aim of eliminating the land of Pequots. It was an intentional attempt at a genocide, uh, which they would continue later on, um, you know, with uh, the way land was used. They would give reservations but then uh, that land would be encroached upon. Uh, so land gets lost more and more and more and more. And the reason why I'm going into this background is to understand how natives end up at sea. Uh, and, uh, you know, Dr. Long's presentation did, you know, a, a quite a good job of, of describing some of the reasons why we're finding, uh, you know, people of color at sea. Uh, so once again, I, I talk about the creation of uh, reservations and praying towns. Uh, on the right, you see a, a hand-drawn map of the uh, Pequot Reservation back uh, as it was originally uh, deeded, which was a, a little over um, uh, 2,500 acres originally. Uh, but within 100 years, it would end up being a less than 1,000 acres. And then in 1855, the, the state sells 700 more acres, leaving them with just 176 acres. Um, land usage patterns go from those overlapping you know, land usage stewarded, uh, stewardship patterns to patterns of land ownership, as you see on the left, um, an area called Noank, now known as Noank, uh, Connecticut, um, land uh, being parsed out into individual plots. Uh, having uh, oceanfront access was very primary, so you see kind of an interesting way that they do it here. They don't make squares, they make very, very long rectangles to try to have as many properties have a little sliver of oceanfront access as possible. Uh, and largely because uh, of the economies are so dependent upon the sea. Uh, not to mention that's a large, where a large part part of uh, a good uh, living, you know, making uh, fishing and things of that sort could happen. And so having access to the sea, especially as a private landowner, uh, was a, a huge advantage. And so as colonization happens, non-native settlers, um, that's typical of the land use patterns. And then later as they settle the West, the West is basically one mile squares. Uh, you know, so the squared use patterns and hard line boundaries that we see here. Um, the economy changes. Native people would li were living under a, a subsistence economy. Uh, 
economy. Uh, but now under English colonization are now uh, seeing the land clear cut, uh, all of the trees, you know, uh, basically all of Connecticut and, and uh, Massachusetts right now have been clear cut historically, uh, the trees sent to, uh, to England uh, and other European ports. Um, and, uh, you know, land being, uh, fences being built, land as own, and so subsistence living, uh, migratory, you know, the, the patterns that were uh, existing could not happen anymore. You were resigned uh, to your reservation territory, and the reservation territory for the Pequots, by the way, uh, as a coastal people is actually inland uh, next to the town of Ledger, and it's a, it's a good seven miles from the coast. Um, not to mention um, the era of slave uh, trade did not uh, uh, over uh, uh, or bypass native people. Um, and so prior to uh, the 18th century, you, you see, um, or, or sorry, in the 18th century, you see uh, uh, native slave trade still occurring. Uh, you know, that started back in the 1500s, many of them going to Europe. But as colonization happens, they tried to make tribes that were defeated in war, like the Pequots into slaves. But what they found out was that they would not be, uh, uh, you know, choose uh, to become good slaves in their home territory. So they were being shipped off to the Caribbean. Um, and there's still a remnant community in Bermuda called the St. David's Islanders, who are all descendants of native peoples from the southern New England area that were shipped off as slaves. So life on the mainland for native peoples was an extremely difficult thing to, you know, you were resigned to a small area at not enough uh, land uh, to live off of subsistence. You start to have to do things like make baskets and sell them or hunt things like snakes uh, and sell uh, the, the, the skins and things like that. Um, and there's only uh, so much land that you have. So it was really a, a tough proposition to stay on land to try to make an economy. And so what ends up happening is many of um, the younger men start to get involved mainly in the whaling industry, you know, so as uh, um, Dr. Long uh, kind of uh, uh, asserted, uh, there was a lot of slave labor, uh, especially in the 17th century. Uh, but as we get into the 18th century, we start to see a lot of people of color taking part in um, uh, the whaling industry actively uh, on purpose, you know, they're, they're, because uh, the whaling industry afforded um, a merit based economy. Economy. It did not matter what color your skin is on a whaling ship. It matters what you know and what you could produce. So Pequot mariners and other mariners, Wampanoag mariners, could rise from cabin boys all the way to captains on these ships. Um, so it was a great way to make a, a good living. And so many of them start to take part in it. Um, and so what ends up happening uh, another thing that happens as well, too, is that um, uh, to, to uh, once again dispossess more land, many Native peoples were uh, oftentimes written about, especially the men, uh, you know, uh, written about at, in the local papers as runaways, deserters, notorious villains. So if they were an indentured servant or something like that, that's what you're seeing as the headlines. Crispus Attucks is a great example of somebody that ends up at sea uh, who was uh, an escaped uh, a slave. Um, you know, and had an advertisement put out for him, you know, and then made, you know, uh, disappeared, you know, from the record books for a while because he was at sea. Uh, there's a reason why um, at sea uh, or on the docks, life was much different. It was all about, you know, what could that economy produce for the world, right, for everybody. And so uh, the workforce was needed. Uh, and so we see large numbers of uh, Pequots and uh, uh, Wampanoags and Shinnecock peoples, uh, all throughout this region here, you know, uh, getting um, uh, the permitting process done to become whalers, uh, you know, full, full, uh, uh, full on whalers and make uh, full livings at it. Um, so um, that's one of the, the, the biggest changes. Now, one of the things that Dr. Uh, Mancini found was that, uh, especially with the Pequot Mariners that he was researching or Mohegan Mariners, uh, is that they were traveling the world. So uh, not only are, are they making an income, um, they are traveling all over the Atlantic. Some of them are going to the Pacific. Uh, you know, they're ending up in places like New Zealand, like Point Lay, Alaska. They're going that far away. So their worldview is changing very 
very, very drastically, uh, you know, as they see this happen. And, uh, you know, uh, that that's another big thing that happens is it really helps the communities to survive uh, the era of the reservation period, and both for the economics that were being brought in, but also for the education that was happening about how the world was being run. Uh, and then when you think of the story of Crispus Attucks, you know, who was, uh, you know, uh, 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 one of these notorious villains or, or sorry, deserter or runaway uh, at one point. Um, how did he end up becoming, uh, you know, being at the Boston Massacre and uh, end up, uh, you know, holding the flag on the side of the Americans? Well, I mean, his background is he was multiracial. Um, and uh, you know, when he came, uh, when he grew up uh, um, next to, as a slave, uh, the Natick Praying Town. His mother was a member of uh, the Natick Praying Town. Um, and after escaping slavery in the docks, you could, you could escape, basically, because it was a whole different world. Um, you know, he goes out to places like Cape Verde uh, and, and, uh, and other uh, places around the world uh, and sees what uh, these economies, this shifting economy is doing for the rest of the world and what America is, you know, uh, the potential is. Uh, but uh, they don't have under British rule, uh, you know, and so that really radicalized him in a lot of ways, uh, saying that, you know, he wasn't really fighting for uh, the the, uh, the white Christian landowners at the time. He was fighting for the freedom of himself and people like himself, uh, you know, in, in a very, very real way, because they saw what was happening in the rest of the world uh, and knew that it could happen in America. It didn't quite work out that way, sadly, uh, you know, in reality, but that's one of the reasons why we see a very big change and Pequot Mariners you know take part in this as well and it happens for well over a hundred years and through Dr. Mancini's research um, you can go to the Mystic Seaport Museum you can look at interactive maps this is just one example of uh, the maps that they have available and uh, this is the voyage of the ship Connecticut it uh, the, this particular log begins July 26 uh, 1832 and ends March 31st 1833 uh, goes through much of the uh, South Atlantic and and uh, the, he's tracking um, um, the crew members, Benjamin Uncas, who was Mohegan, Elisha Apes, uh, Charles Brayton, Mashantucket Pequot, uh, and uh, Joseph Fagans, who is also Mashantucket Pequot. And um, then there's uh, other ones that you can see as well. And then there's also what they have, a, a tool that they call story maps that uh, allow you to see the records of these mariners on land. So not only uh, can you look at where they were, what they were doing in the log books, where they were going to, to, to whale and all of these types of things, what ports did they hit? But um, through um, those story maps, you can actually track what was happening as they were being enumerated on land and really start to put together the whole entire picture of why you know people of color, native peoples, uh, mariners, especially during this period, in this region would, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, uh, in great, very great numbers take part uh, in the whaling industry and how that mariner life really changed uh, the worldview of the people and uh, continued the survivance um, of the people, but was also used by the people on land, enumerating these reservations as a way to take more land because the men would be gone for so long, these years sometimes, these journeys sometimes taking years, um, that they would count less and less of them. And that was more reason to sell more Indian land. So there was, uh, there's give and take to, you know, the, the good and the bad of it, you could say, but it definitely is part of the story and it is definitely not told enough. All right, thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Newell, that was um, great. Do we have any questions coming up in the chat? Let me just check. Yeah, as you guys are thinking of your questions, um, one that came to mind for me was, I know in a lot of indigenous studies, you kind of fight this narrative of erasure. Um, your history didn't end, you know, in the 17th century, 18th century. So how, how is this research and this work kind of, kind of viewed today within, um, you know, specifically Wabanaki, but also in Southern New England and, and kind of promoting and improving that narrative of that indigenous peoples fought for America, maybe not for the same reasons, um, I am struck by Mr. Donald Saktama, who spoke for us a number of weeks ago, speaking about the soldiers in World War I, um, going over there and fighting for our country, not being citizens. 
So could you maybe speak to kind of how this work um, is, is hopefully changing some of that narrative today? Yeah, absolutely. I, I mean, once again, I, I talk about that century as if it's a lost century because, and it really is, uh, because the American conservation movement is born in the 19th century and what they started to collect and record at that period was tribes that they felt were, you know, more authentic, you know, so it was non-native people authentic, authenticating Indianness, I guess you could say, um, and they were basically collecting from Western uh, tribes and Southwestern tribes. So that's why in a museum in Boston, if you go to see the art and go to the the native north american wing you will see uh basically all um you know uh western art of uh, beadwork uh southwestern pottery represented but you won't see any of the wampum artwork that is being created the ashland basketry that, that you see uh you know that became part of the market economy uh and that became fancy basketry into uh, you know the items that you see sold there that became a very very high level art um so this stays uh, the the status quo for the colonial museum and conservation world from the time the conservation movement is born um, to only authentic authentic uh, authenticate um, uh, Western tribes as actually native, you know, and and so the whole story of what's happening to the East Coast tribes gets, you know, totally glossed over. Uh, native peoples become things like cobblers and become mariners and things like that. Uh, but because they're taking part in the market economy, they're being viewed by uh, the museum sciences as not as authentic uh, as the other tribes, even though they were living the life that they were forced to by as a result of colonization. And and what I always tell people is that, uh, you know, um, uh, you know, all cultures change, all cultures are dynamic. And even that map that I show of the uh, indigenous landscape prior to colonization, there's a lot of flux and change in technology and things of that sort. Uh, when the Europeans arrived with metal goods, uh, it was only natural that native people would take advantage of, of the new technologies. They had always done that through trade throughout the entire region there. Um, you know, so just because you see cultures that are decimated by intentional gen genocide, but still surviving looking different does not make them less than less authentic. Uh, they are still blood tied uh, to those same people. It's just the effect of colonization has been longer. Um, and so the uh, the uh, culture change was more dynamic as a way to, to shift uh, through survivance. And once again, if that had not happened, um, you know, then these communities would not have survived. My, uh, the community I am coming to you from is the Mashantucket Pequot community. This Reservation was established in the year 1666. It is the oldest continuously occupied reservation in the country. It was knocked down at one point to just 179 acres and only a couple of people could live here year round. The rest of the folks came in, you know, part of the year, but worked and had to work off reservation uh, in, in some of the coastal towns. And so that's what we end up seeing is as a result of the whaling industry uh, and a result of the loss of land on the reservations, um, native neighborhoods start to get created, like the Westerly Indian neighborhood and in the city of Boston and the city of Providence and others, we see whole neighborhoods, uh, uh, you know, start to coalesce of native people all living together, not from one tribe, from many tribes to take part in the economy. And it also happens that al uh, almost always these neighborhoods uh, were neighbors of uh, black and Italian uh, um, communities as well. Uh, and so there's a lot of intermarriage that happens. And so for Southern New England tribes, uh, uh, they uh, many of them uh, intermarry with black communities and uh, you know because they did not look as the stereotypical 19th century western indian that's another way on the enumeration to count less indians they would you know just by looking at them saying that they were black you know or something and so it was a common uh, thing for for natives in this region to have throughout their lifetime to be recorded uh, as black white red you know half black you know just a million different things throughout their lifetime uh, uh, the census takers wanting to call them anything but uh, Pequot or, or Wampanoag or whatever as a way to take more land. Yeah, and that's just a, it's an interesting concept that you bring up of authenticity, because I think even within the museum field, um, a lot of people want to, to have that exhibit on authentic indigenous cultures, but it doesn't allow for change. It doesn't allow for evolution. Um, you know, here at Maine Maritime Museum, we have uh, this birch bark canoe um, on loan from the Jefferson Historical Society. And we, we, that's kind of what we grapple with is what's, what important stories are there to tell both in terms of its history, because it does date to the 18th century, but how do we make that story not 
guess cliche for last lack of a better word and allow mm -hmm. for for these cultures um to evolve and yeah yeah and and i like to use those words like technology especially when i talk to kids because when you say that word to kids they think of ipad screens and things like that but the birch bark canoe um you know is the reason why the wheel wasn't invented in the northeast because you know invention uh, necessity is causes an invention right the wheel you know build you get carts you had need something to pull them you need uh you know uh, animals to do that you got to build roads you can't just take them over uh you know especially in the northeast here with the uh the, our landscape you can't just take them over land um, you know, so the hot the the highways were the rivers, uh, especially throughout the Northeast, and you can make journeys of a thousand miles from the Gas Bay Peninsula all the way down to Long uh, Island Sound, and people knew that and had it all mapped out through songs and stories. And the way you did it was by birch bark canoe, very lightweight piece of technology. You can portage it rather easily from river to river. These were well known routes uh, that were known by peoples all throughout the region, uh, and it's actually you know uh, uh, kind of funny that you know people uh, look to the lack of of the invention of the wheel by tribes in the region as some sort of uh, you know like kind of like where we were backwards technologically but um honestly when europeans brought uh carts and things like that you know they would do things like ask you know to uh, uh ask native people to take them uh exploring and there are written accounts of you know literally where uh, uh the explorers are you know kind of harping on the 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 better technology of using a cart and a horse and all of this to lug all their stuff and they get to a place where they can't take it across and they have to actually take the animals off they have to take the entire cart apart lug all of the cargo across where they need it to get to put the cart back together and the native guides are just basically sitting there like oh my god you know so uh is it really better right and wheels were invented by american peoples uh in um, various native american peoples they were just often more used as toys uh so you know once again it's, it's necessity that causes invention and uh technology like the birch bark canoe uh is terrific uh piece of technology that native uh, non-native peoples would end up adopting uh learning from and adopting uh as we see in the state of Maine, uh, you know, uh, the canoe is, is used by, any, uh, you know, uh, enthusiasts all over the state, you know, uh, and around the world these days. Thank you, Mr. Noel. I appreciate that. We'll definitely dig into that more in the, in the panel. Um, so I do want to invite uh, Dr. Burroughs, um, our next speaker, if you don't mind sharing your screen. Uh, what do I do? Trying to share my screen. I'm going to share my screen. Oh, there we go. Yes. Oh, what is it? Okay. Screen. Yeah. Yes. We're not seeing it on our end. Yes, um, um, forgive me. Uh, this is, it wants me to open security and privacy to grant access. Okay. So Sarah, uh, are you able to yeah. pull up? All right, then we'll, we'll do that. Uh, appreciate it. Yeah, no problem. Yes, so um, thank you, Sarah, for the invitation and um, really glad to, to join you this afternoon. Um, 
I wish I really were in me right about now. Um, the picture that's up on the screen is from my last visit because um, we, my kids and I go up there, you know, as often as, as, as we can. My introduction was when I went up to do research on um, John Rosworn and, and fell in love, you know, with the, the local culture. Um, and so my presentation today is on John Rosworn, who I refer to as a child and a citizen of the Atlantic. Um, next slide, please. So we can move on. Next one. So Rosworm was really iconic in the 1800s. If you go online and do a search for the last name, Rosworm, which is a German name, you'll find that John Rosworm comes up more frequently than any other. So um, the name is more widely associated with this man who spent his childhood in Maine. Uh, he graduated from Baldwin College in 1826, uh, the second or third African-American college graduate. Uh, and uh, he earned a master's degree as well. He then moved to New York City where he co-founded the first black newspaper, Freedom's Journal. Next slide, thanks. So I wanna share a riddle with you before I get into my presentation. And it's a quote, it says, I have nine children, my wife has 11, but 13 all counted. There are four boys or sons, none are full brothers. So I'll leave that for a minute to see if you can sort it out. And at some point in the pre presentation, I'll pause. And um, if you think you have the answer, you know, you, you can give it. This quote is from Rosworm's stepfather and I'll introduce the family in a, in a minute. Next slide, Sarah, thanks. So Rosworm, I call a man of the Atlantic. Um, during his lifetime, the, uh, just as you know, er, my, the earlier speaker was talking about people using the riverways uh, of uh, New England to travel by canoe, the Atlantic was that broader you know, uh, waterway uh, that connected the different continents uh, in the, the 1800s. So Roswell was born in Jamaica in 1799 uh, to an American father and a Jamaican woman, a uh, black woman. His dad adopted him uh, and um, legitimized the son who was born out of wedlock. Uh, gave him his name and um, moved him from Jamaica to Quebec to go to school. And then John comes to Maine as an adolescent, ends up in New York as an editor. Along the way, he taught high school and lower level schools uh, for black students in Philly, New York, and Boston. And then he ends up in Liberia in West Africa as a governor of a colony set up by um, the State Colonization Society of Maryland. That colony was called Maryland in Africa. And as you can see, his life kind of circumscribes the Atlantic. Next slide, please. So John's father moved from Jamaica to Portland in 1806. And he's listed in the literature as an attorney, a manager, uh, and a merchant. And he establishes himself, he moved from Portland, Jamaica, I should say, and he establishes himself in Portland, Maine in 1812. His mother was described as a Creole woman, or in some places, a colored lady from a very respectable family. And it said that she was the source of the real estate his father held while he was in Jamaica. Uh, 
Next. <clears throat> so John R. Rosworm, uh, that would be John Brown's father, was engaged as a merchant. He acquired um, 75 acres in Back Cove uh, and uh, married uh, Susanna Waterford in 1813, about a year after he had moved to uh, Portland. She was a widow with three children. And sh shortly after, it was found that she was expecting a child after her marriage to, to John R. And that son was named Francis Edward Roswell, and he was born in 1814. Next slide. So here is the Roswell family home, which is on the historical register. And it's at Ocean Avenue, Portland. Uh, the current owners were really generous when I visited. They gave me a tour, uh, moved around in the interior of the building. And uh, you can tell that, you know, this was a, a home of, owned by someone who was very successful. It, it was a luxurious um, space. Uh, the knobs on the doors were coated with porcelain in some rooms, the rooms that were public facing, like the living room, uh, whereas the other spaces were, the knobs were more basic. Next slide. So John Brown, the son, was initially just known by his first two names. And then later on, when his father became more involved in his life, he was um, recognized and given the name Roswell as well. He went to school in Canada. And while he was there, the father informed Susan, whom he had just married, that he had this son from a previous relationship uh, and he wanted the boy to join them in Maine. And Susan agreed and she became the mother and the, the main influence on John Brown uh, for the rest of his life, pretty much. So he arrives in Maine sometime between 1814 and 1815. And shortly after he arrives, his father dies, which proves to be catastrophic. Next slide. Uh, fortunately, uh, one of Rosworm's, John, John Brown's sisters, stepsisters, uh, prepared an account of the family and uh, interviewed her mom. There were others who interviewed her as well and, and recorded her, her memories of, uh, of John and their interactions. And so she says that when her husband died, John was left entirely in her care with a small legacy which she intended he would use to finish his education. But the estate languished in court from 1815 to 1818. Next slide, please. So John ends up leaving uh, Maine for Jamaica. And he is convinced that had he been white, he never would have had to leave. At that point, he despaired of, of getting uh, the father's legacy. He was hoping some of his father's friends would have supported his um, education. Susan remembers his stepmom, quote, the sorrow he expressed at parting with her children, particularly his infant brother. Next slide. So William Hawes now marries Susan. He is a widower with two children. Together, they ended up having six children. John returns to Portland from Jamaica. He's embarrassed to come back to the family. Uh, he's living in a community where most blacks in Portland uh, were congregated and uh, many of them were 
involved with um, shipping in some form or the other. When William Hawes and uh, Susan realize that John is in town, they get word that he is. William invites him to join the family and he does. At that point, William Hawes is working at a paper mill on the Royal River. Next slide. So that's the answer to the riddle that uh, William Hawes would recite oftentimes at work and, and to others that he, he interacted with. And he would ask if they could figure it out. According to Sarah, uh, John's stepsister, the 13 children all lived as one family pleasantly with each other. She said, I never heard father or mother, I never knew father or mother to strike one of the children. A mild reproof was the only punishment. Next slide. So at this point, uh, Susan asks Calvin Stockbridge to serve as guardian for John. The Stockbridge was from a prominent family uh, in, in Portland, family that dates back to the Mayflower. He co-owned a, a paper mill and he and his brother were very prominent uh, Baptists. He was a delegate to the main convention and uh, a Mason. Next, please. So between ages 19 and 24, John attends a Hebron Academy. It gets destroyed by fire. So he leaves Maine, teaches at a black school in Philly, the African Free School in New York, and the African school in Boston, and then he returns to Maine. Next slide. He then enters Baldwin College and he's there between 1824 and 1826. The curriculum at the time included solid geometry, Latin, Greek, and philosophy. Uh, students were expected to have daily prayers and recitations before breakfast. And among his schoolmates were Henry Wadsworth Longfellow and Franklin Pierce. Nathaniel Hawthorne was also a student um, at the time. Next slide, please. Horatio Bridge, one of his classmates re recalled that Rosworm lived at a carpenter's house just beyond the village limits. And he said that he and Nathaniel Hawthorne called on him several times, but his sensitivity on account of his color preventing him, prevented him from returning the calls. Next slide. John graduated in 1826. And uh, remarkably, he was invited to give a commencement address. Um, according to a news report on the commencement, quote, the beauty and fashion, prejudice and power of Maine were present for the occasion. John chose to speak on the condition and prospects of Haiti, which was very controversial at the time because uh, the Haitian revolution had sparked a lot of anxiety and fear, uh, especially in the South. He said that initially he seemed timid, but then eventually he launched into what the writer called a full and manly tone with appropriate uh, gestures. Extracts of his address were carried in at least eight uh, papers in the Northeast. Next slide. So a year after graduating, John is in New York and he co-founds and launches the first black newspaper in America. And the first editorial in the paper said, quote, we wish to plead our own cause. Too long have others spoken for us. Too long 
has the public been deceived by misrepresentations in things which concern us dearly? Next slide. But by 1829, two years after the paper was launched, John decides to fold it, to close it, and he opts to emigrate to Liberia. He, in a farewell editorial, says that in Liberia, quote, we may not only feel as men, but there we may also act as such. He deplores racial prejudice in the US at the time as much as any man, but he said, quote, they are not of our creating and they are not in our power to remove, end quote. Please, uh, next slide. So the colony of Liberia was founded in 1821. In fact, uh, December of this year will mark the 200th anniversary of its founding. And uh, the initial population was a mix of indigenous Africans, US repatriates and recaptives, people who were liberated from slave ships. So it started off as a settlement of a few hundred acres and then gradually grew over time. And the Liberians declared their independence in 1847. Next slide. In Liberia, uh, Rosworm went on to an equally uh, illustrious career. He founded the Liberia Herald in 1830, Liberia's first newspaper. He served as secretary of the Liberia colony. And then he was appointed governor of Maryland in Africa. There were several small colonies along the coast of West Africa that were operated separately from Liberia. And he was the first black person to serve as governor of any of those colonies. After he died, a few years after, Maryland and Africa became a part of what is now Liberia. Next slide. Thank you very much. Uh, that's a brief overview of uh, the story of John Rosworm, and I'm glad to take any questions or comments you might have. Uh, thank you, Dr. Burroughs. Um, again, yes, please enter your questions in the, the Q&A panel. Um, I have a question. Um, so I've done just the briefest of research on um, Robert Benjamin Lewis, who lived in Bath um, in pre-1850. So along the same, I think he actually had almost the exact same life and death dates as um, John Brown Rustworm. Um, so for those who may not be familiar, Robert Benjamin Lewis, um, he, he served on ships, he did some maritime inventions, but is probably a little bit better known for publishing um, what is considered the first uh, African-American and Native universal history um, in the 1830s. Um, and kind of why I bring him up is just these parallels, because uh, he was also interested in immigrating to Haiti at the tail end of this, this revolution and, and creating this new colony uh, for uh, free Blacks from America, free slaves. Um, and then there's, it seems to be a, after post-emancipation, um, kind of a switch. And there's this other document that we've uncovered of kind of Brunswick and Bath and Topsom kind of supporting, um, excuse my language, and, and this is the, the wording that they use, kind of the Negro exodus out of me, supporting and, and pushing um, these black communities that have you know, been living here for generations at this point um, to these elsewhere, right? To, to Haiti, to Liberia. Um, but instead of kind of the Rock, John Brown Russworm or the Robert Benjamin Lewis's kind of supporting and, and, and fueling that drive, it seems after emancipation, 
um, Frederick Douglass, he's, he's responding to this call in Bath with a response that says, stand where you are and conduct yourself in a way that you know, makes it difficult for wanting people to remove you. So I, I was just wondering if um, kind of that, that larger macro history, if you could speak to kind of what the change is, is it just the emancipation? What, what causes this kind of shift to go elsewhere, um, create new colonies to kind of standing your ground in the words of Frederick Douglass? Mm -hmm. Yeah, of course. Um, the, the story was really dynamic and uh, major social changes would produce differing kinds of responses. Uh, there was always this ambigu ambiguity of uh, the African-American status in America. And given that ambiguity, the African-Americans would try to determine where they thought they would fit best. So while in the pre-Civil War era, there were those who felt they would stand their ground um, regardless of, of whatever the conditions they encountered. There were others who thought this is not, change is not gonna happen in my lifetime. We will not achieve equality or, or civil rights. And so I'll, I'll prefer to go someplace else. And um, thousands of African-Americans went across the border to Canada. And there were some who ended up in Sierra Leone because British philanthropists moved people from Nova Scotia, loyalist blacks to Sierra Leone and others went to you know, the Caribbean, particularly Haiti, thousands went to, to Haiti as well. So especially in the pre-Civil War period, uh, African-Americans were making many of those kinds of choices. And then post-Civil War, uh, there's an ebb and flow. Uh, during Reconstruction, th there's a lot of African-American optimism and you see immigration to Liberia and places like that decline. But with the end of Reconstruction and the rise of Jim Crow, uh, there's renewed interest in immigration. Some of that ends up being directed towards the, um, the West. And so you have the exodusters, you know, going to Kansas and, and places like that, as they, call, as they were called. At a the macro level, these, these, like you said, these ebbs and flows of kind of what causes people to, to rise up for or away. And again, just kind of thinking, you know, the Haitian Revolution tied to slavery, Liberia, the, the place founded for freed, um, slaves that you know, white culture wanted to move elsewhere and kind of all related to these maritime trade yeah. networks. And, and it's kind of, again, kind of what we said earlier um, with uh, Dr. Longs, it's just kind of these, how these hyper-local histories, um, when you take a step back, you can really start to see this web of, of stories that haven't necessarily been told. Um, because we're, we're focused on kind of the cargo and the trade and the captains. And um, meanwhile, there's this, this understructure of support um, that are equally important and fascinating to learn about. Sure. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Burroughs. And thank you, Dr. Long um, and Mr. Newell. Um, so we are going to transition now to our panel discussion. I am going to hand it off to Luke Yates Malardo, who is our museum educator and Christopher Tim, who is our interim director, and they are going to start us off with some questions and lead our panel discussion with all three of our speakers. I do invite, they have some prepared questions, um, but I do invite if you have any questions that you're just too shy um, to, to mention earlier, now's your chance, put them in the chat or in the Q&A, um, and we'll be monitoring that, and I'll be um, politely interrupting with those questions um, during the conversation. So uh, thank you so much. And I hand it off to Chris and Luke. Great. Uh, yeah, first of all, I just want to thank our three speakers. We are so appreciative uh, and we're so grateful uh, that you took the time to share your expertise and research with us today. So thank you to all three of you. Um, so as Sarah said, we'd like to open up for kind of a panel discussion amongst uh, the three of you. Uh, to get us started, Luke and I have a few questions from our staff. 
uh, a few others that we've been kind of receiving in the Q&A throughout this session. Um, and attendees, please feel free to keep those um, coming as well. Um, so I guess one thing I, I'm interested in is what kind of challenges you've encountered at museums and research libraries as you've been doing your work that is maybe kind of specific to your topic, your own research, maybe your methodology. Um, so I'm kind of thinking about like how materials are processed and cataloged and, and kind of um, defined, if you will. Um, you know, how what are museum collecting what are museums collecting and what are they not? Uh, what simply is challenged by what, what survives and what doesn't? Um, so maybe um, Mr. Newell, maybe could start kind of that conversation and we kind of see, see how that unfolds. Um, yeah, so, you know, this particular era, once again, we're talking, I'm talking about East Coast tribes is, is largely just unwritten about because the people who authenticated uh, or, or, you know, uh, authenticating, you know, natives, uh, you know, during this time period on the East Coast um, did not feel that East Coast tribes, you know, they, they felt too impacted. Um, and so when you go and look for records uh, of this sort, they just, they're, they're kept in, in a, a, almost like a, a different world uh, in a lot of ways. Uh, and so, uh, you know, the way Dr. Mancini stumbled upon this was he was doing family research. He was researching family lines uh, and uh, the Mashantuck and Pequot Museums close to New London, Connecticut. New London at one time was the second largest whaling port in the world um, and was tracking down and found out that one uh, family member uh, that he was researching, um, you know, uh, had a, a tie to the port uh, at New London. And when he went down there, he discovered that in one year uh, they had uh, uh, issued as many as a thousand uh, of the safety permits that are required to to go out whaling to native mariners from that one port uh, in that particular year. And that all of a sudden opened up, uh, you know, a whole world of, of what is out there. But he's had to reconstruct this, you know, bit by bit, piece by piece. He is, you know, when you see those logbooks, he is going off to Point Lay, Alaska. He is going to New Zealand and going to these ports, looking at those old historical logbooks, looking for those names of those handwritten names of people in the logs and what they were doing uh, and, and tracking that all down. So when when it comes to you know how this information was collected um you know it is still an active process happening as we speak uh the mystic seaport museum and the new uh um, bedford whaling museum uh featured dr M uh, manson's research and there's also uh, mancini's research and there's also uh something he called uh created called the indian mariners project which you can look up online um and find more information on but it is still very much an active research topic and so it's something that you know he's passing on to the younger people Lots, uh, and younger uh, Native peoples in this region here, what he's learned so that they can pick up, uh, you know, the, uh, uh, the research and, and continue it on because there's so much to be learned. I mean, all we see is little snapshots of what happened at sea, little snapshots of what happened on land, and there's so many gaps of what's going on in the middle. Um, and those gaps are, are really, you know, uh, where the research is going to take us eventually. Fascinating. Dr. Long, Dr. Burroughs, any, any kind of similar um, experiences? Well, I'll address the fact that um, for me, there are very little records that address um, because so many uh, written records weren't kept, especially identifying people of color. Mm -hmm. And so I have to use clues, um, you know, like kind of um, a, a clue that leads to something else that leads to another source. And um, it, it's very interesting. And when I visit um, museum uh, collections, they uh, attest to the fact that, you know, they're very slim on black seamen or mariners or uh, that uh, it's hard to collect that data. Mm -hmm. I think in my case, you know, the experience has been a, a, a bit different. Um, my focus I think, I think we lost you, uh, Dr. Burroughs, just for one second on mute. Yeah, okay. Right. So um, yeah, in my case, the experience has been a little different in that um, a lot of my research is focused on free Blacks, and uh, there are more records on free Blacks, although they haven't always been fully uh, utilized by historians. Uh, 
in one case in particular, I can, I can cite the American Colonization Society um, produced quite a, 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 a bit of paperwork regarding its uh, efforts. And while a lot of the focus was on the leadership of the American Colonization Society, they also preserved letters that came in from free blacks who participated, as well as uh, some who were manumitted to go to Liberia and who were literate. And so they, they wrote as well, but many of those records have not been tapped. So they're sitting there and, they, and you know, they could add a lot, not just to the story of Liberia, but to the African-American, you know, the, the history of African-Americans as well. Uh, but um, they've not been fully utilized. I think the challenge that I've faced has been with the perceived separation between working on someone like Rosworm, who spent time in Liberia, and then the, that, that era, that period of his life is seen as totally cut off from his time in the US mm -hmm. and from his experience, his childhood in, in Jamaica. And his case is complicated by the fact that for a portion of his adolescence, he was in a largely white world in living in a white family, so to speak in Maine. And uh, so that complicates things because if you're pursuing sources on African-Americans during that era, you get to the, the period of his life in Maine and it ends up being kind of cut off. So it's transcending those artificial boundaries that was complicated you know, in pursuit of this story. Mm -hmm. Hmm. I mean, that's fine. I mean, it's just when when your researchers like you are, are weaving in different institutional records and, and kind of also different types of um, collecting institutions. I mean, it, it's that's such a complex thing, you know, thing to weave together. And, and we have a lot of conversations just internally amongst our staff of just our collection alone here that we have. I mean, we have 20,000 artifacts. We have 3000 linear feet of archival information. Those aren't Wow. Those aren't cataloged and indexed at a single moment. So some things are indexed 10, 20 years ago where conversations and, and focuses and methodologies were completely different. So that's just, just such a challenge to just perpetually a catalog new items, but then also just recataloging and, and looking at, you know, making them more accessible to, to researchers. Um, so this, this conversation is just so helpful to kind of learn from and, and think about, you know, uh, from the researcher perspective of, how we can help um, better. Um, yeah, thank you. Uh, Luke, uh, do, do, do you have a question that you wanted to kind of pose for the group? Yeah, sure, thank you. And I also want to just reiterate gratitude for being here and presenting with us today, thanks. Um, this question, along the lines of what we were just discussing, what advice in your experience researching might you have for institutions wanting to focus more on these under-acknowledged historical perspectives and how can museums, libraries, and local historical societies best engage communities in types of conversations on racial equity, justice, and education? Um, maybe Dr. Long, you could start, or, or anyone really. Um, I think inviting uh, the public to um, uh, donate uh, artifacts, copies of, of um, uh, any uh, records that they may be holding in family collections. Uh, I know for one, uh, my family has been in the uh, mortuary business since 1918 and obituaries are a rich source, um, mm -hmm. rich primary source, mm -hmm. uh, secondary source as well. But we uh, get called quite often from uh, researchers, uh, movie producers and such to look through the archives of the obituaries since the a funeral home is so old, since 1918. And I think that's a source that's often overlooked is um, uh, the obituaries and, and, and just um, the written obituaries for family copies as well as newspaper records and obituaries. So that's just one I think of that most people don't access enough. And then on the other side, conversely, I teach people 
to record accurate obituaries and full obituaries uh, rather than just, you know, one sheet of paper about people because we never know how those people connect in professions and career pathways mm -hmm. um, with the research that's needed. Mm -hmm. Dr. Long, that's, that's really interesting. If I may I, I jump in here, this concept of an accurate obituary. Um, so Luke and I have been um, doing some separate research for another project um, on some of the local Black families in the New Meadows region, which is kind of the land between Brunswick and Bath, um, and Francis Houston, um, an early 19th century kind of patriarchal leader of a, of a very established Black family. Um, married um, his wife Mary and her bitch or no her what she wrote for her husband when he died is drastically a different life story than what his daughter wrote um, and she the wife Mary is kind of promoting this this narrative that Francis was an escaped slave when he came up to Maine whereas his daughter is downplaying that narrative um, and doesn't even feature. Um, and I think some, some researchers talking to some of the local historical societies um, have, from what they can glean, because there is this lack of a record, um, have figured out he probably wasn't an escaped slave, but she was. So uh -huh. is she amplifying this narrative Mm -hmm. And why? Um, so yeah, it's, it's a kind of the, the pitfalls of archival research and this kind of primary source research, and especially made doubly hard when um, it's these are histories that, um, like uh, Dr. Burroughs is saying, is is kind of bifurcated. There's the library uh -huh. history; it's not connected with the, the stateside history. Uh -huh. um, so yeah, is it, have have any of you kind of experienced that kind of? differentiation in the record and how do you go about telling that story or the complexities of that story? Well, can I address that? Because um, I want to talk about when you say two sides of an obituary, for instance, um, people and even within families know the person differently. Mm -hmm. So a child wouldn't have exposure to a parent as an adult in the same way that adults interact. Mm -hmm. um, so that you really have to use discernment um, when you're weighing what 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 is true and based on time periods and life cycles, uh, because um, I find that children often um, I don't always rely on what they're saying because they don't know their parents as adults. They know them as parents and that's one dimensional usually mm -hmm. um, because you could ask my children right now, what did I do? They wouldn't be able to tell you, <laughs> you know, I mean, <laughs> not accurately. They would say she's an educator, you know, and that's it. And so um, I think you need a lot of parts um, to look at the different dimensions and the life stages. Uh, of a person. Mm -hmm. Yes, I agree. I, I, and I think um, Dr. Long has raised a really important, I mean, several important issues, but one of them has to do with the significance of obituaries. And uh, there are mortu mortuary services across the country where they were geared towards serving communities of color and those records, you know, if they were made available to the public, to researchers, would add immensely to the sources we have. Um, so my take on the issue is that um, people are multidimensional. Uh, and so those who know us will know different sides oftentimes. And it's not a matter of picking the one true side. Sometimes it's about putting the pieces together to create a whole. Uh, but if we had access to those obituaries, oh my goodness, I can just imagine how much richness, you know, they provide. I remember working in West Virginia during a period and I was connected with the Black History um, Society there. And a man came up to me, his father had been a photographer in the Black community and he brought a shoebox of photos 
He said, you know, I, I don't know where these could be placed to be preserved. So I'm thinking I'll leave them with you and you can you know, make the necessary contacts. Among the photos were young men dressed in their uniforms, preparing to go off to the Second World War. Uh, but then there were also mm -hmm. photographs of people, you know, at funerals, including mm -hmm. the deceased. Mm -hmm. uh, so there was a tradition of taking pictures, you know, of um, loved ones uh, who had passed. And mm -hmm. there's a lot of material, rich material in, in private hands yes. that if made available would add, you know, quite a bit to what we're doing. And, and may I piggyback um, the Black Press, because you meant uh, your subject, um, Mr. Uh, Restaurant. Mm -hmm. He started the black press mm -hmm. but there is rich is 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 robust mm -hmm. with information i was looking at um uh, i was looking at um looking for someone um in alabama this week and found them in a archived um copy of of the black newspaper mm -hmm. in alabama mm -hmm. at the time mm -hmm. and just a, just a little bitty blurb about yes. the person that it described, it was just what I needed to place them in a in a connect them yes. to people and times that you know I was looking for a time frame and so the date on the newspaper um, validated what I was looking for and that paper only ran for seven years, but um, there were other papers that ran longer. But I think that. That's a vast repository across the nation that probably um, mainstream museums don't know about and aren't accessing. Yes. I, I did want to go back to Luke's question. Um, so Dr. Long's you know, uh, response was so rich, I, I felt like I had to, to, to engage. But yes, yeah, to Luke, I would say exactly what you have done in putting this symposium together is what I would recommend for museums, you know, to, to, be, to begin this process of making known to broad communities uh, the resources you have available, the fact that you are welcoming their engagement. Uh, I feel remiss because I didn't contribute to um, sharing the information as broadly as I could have, but I would, uh, based on that recognition, I do want to say to you that um, it, it's a process. And over time, you will learn how to connect with those publics. And the better you connect, the further out the word goes that here's this tremendous you know, uh, collection and that the collection, those who are the custodians are inviting people of color, you know, researchers to, to come in and, and be involved. But if this is recorded and made available, I'll do everything I can to make up for the fact that I didn't send the invitations out earlier. I'll invite people to, to come in and uh, be in touch. I agree. There are a couple of questions in the chat, I see. Okay. Um, I, I'd just like to jump in really quickly to respond to, uh, to Luke's question. Uh, when it comes to native populations and collecting institutions, um, there, there really needs to be some realization and some reckoning that has to happen there. Um, there's a reason why my father's uh, generation would not even walk into a collecting institution, much less work for one or work with you. Uh, you know, and that's because, uh, you know, the, the sciences of archaeology and anthropology have centered, uh, you know, European Western views and, and have done so in a way that has dehumanized native people in these spaces uh, with the collecting of human remains uh, and uh, and thing and the, the display of those remains um you know so one of the things that needs to happen uh, dr long really kind of uh got into a, a really good piece of it is that when we look at primary sources we can't take them at face value and uh, if that has been the status quo of your collecting institution is taking uh you know uh, primary sources at face value in that way um you know when it comes to native histories you got to remember that uh native histories are are dealing with uh genocides loss of population 
to disease, war, uh, land dispossession, things of that sort. And histories are written by the victors. Uh, and so therefore, if you're taking, uh, you know, primary sources at face value, you are missing out on so much. And one of the things that I did uh, when I worked with the Leventhal Map Center on uh, their uh, exhibit on 19th century westward expansion is I created a set of inquiries for people to think about, especially children, as they go through museum spaces. Um, you know, and uh, the questions are, uh, what are the stories that have shaped our understanding of U.S. history? Who are the storytellers, which is what Dr. Long was really getting into there, you know, because uh, that matters. And what are the stories that we still need to hear? Uh, so where, where is that erasure happening? Right. And where, why is it intentional? And if your collecting institution has been part of that status quo, how do you reckon with that and then change uh, within your own environment? Thank you very much, all, all of you, for, for that, the variety of answers. They're all really constructive and inspiring. Um, to Chris's point, that's, that's work that we are actively trying to do in schools, and it's the more we learn, the better, better off we'll be. So thank you all. Um, Chris, Tim, I don't know if you want another question or if we should maybe speak to some of the questions in the chat. Um, yeah, I guess just real quickly, I have one, one, one other one here um, in, in that, I, that I see here. So it's just kind of, a, I guess, maybe comment on how the project maybe evolved over time. I mean, how did, how did you kind of set off on, on the research topic or um, kind of line of inquiry at the beginning? And how did that relate to the kind of what our attendees heard today? What sort of kind of maybe unexpected turns, uh, you know, and kind of discoveries happened under under that process, because obviously it's not a single moment in, in time. Um, any Anything to kind of share with our att attendees on, on that question? So my journey uh, to the story of John Rosworn um, began when I was a doctoral student, and the man who became my mentor and um, chair of my committee bought a copy of the Liberia Herald, which Roswell had edited. He saw this you know, in a used bookstore. At the time it was cheap. Uh, the internet has made a lot of you know, rare books and other items um, much more expensive. Uh, the prices are competitive across the country. But in any event, he found this old paper. I was from Liberia, he knew it. So he, he bought it and, and gave that to me. And I was fascinated. I, I had no idea that there was a newspaper in Liberia going back to the 1830s. Uh, and then I saw the, the name of the editor. I knew of Rosworm's involvement with the black press in America, uh, but this kind of, piqued my curiosity. And along the way, I began picking up, you know, more and more information about him. Where I am now is um, I've completed an article for a journal that looks at the agents of Freedom's Journal, his newspaper in the US, because the agents were the distributors and they would collect stories for the paper and they existed along the Eastern seaboard as far as South as North Carolina. And then there was a gap and then there were agents in New Orleans and others in Haiti and in Liverpool. Again, the Atlantic figures in as a, a major you know, uh, connector. And um, so I, I, I'm flipping the script to go from you know, focusing on the editors to look at um, the larger network uh, of, of distributors. But the story continues, the journey continues. Great, yeah, thank you. I have about just a couple minutes left and I think um, a great concluding question is one from the chat um, is, um, maybe Mr. Newell, I'll start with you here. What creative teaching tools do you think are effective with educating young people about these issues? My hat's off to those who teach young people because um, <laughs> I spent my life in I, uh, oftentimes working with graduate students on dissertations and, and thesis. But um, 
Well, imagine, you know, with the multimedia resources we have today, uh, I'm, I'm finding things online that uh, help me with my learning experience. Of, and I know that there are programs, social studies programs that are, or have organized a lot of material and made them available as well. Those could serve as models. Um, I, well, I started at early childhood and worked up to higher ed. So, and whatever I know is antiquated in the lower grades, but I um, have grandchildren and the multimedia uh, formats work so well with them and practical experiences. I think um, uh, taking children to museum spaces, to um, um, community, uh, community places to have opportunities to engage in actual um, research or to um, have um, uh, puzzles, puzzles and those type activities for critical thinking because it really is about critical thinking uh, when you look at um, this type inquiry. Mm -hmm. I agree. Uh, I'm a big fan of technology. My, my father's always been there as well. Uh, I got involved with uh, working with documentary film as a teenager initially. Uh, never made a film, but I've worked uh, in and around film for quite a bit. Uh, and, uh, you know, with the, the advancement of technology, my father's been in an amateur conservator his entire life. Um, but with these new cell phones and everything, everybody can be a conservator. Everybody can uh, highlight these stories. They can go and visit elders and get permission to tell them their stories and, and, and document them. Uh, and so I would encourage people to take advantage uh, of, of these tools and uh, begin documentation of your own, uh, you know, uh, as a way and, and, and uh, uh, as a way of uplifting the stories that have been part of the, the erasure narrative. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much, everyone. Um, so I want to personally thank Mr. Newell, Dr. Long, Dr. Burroughs, uh, for sharing your knowledge and your time today. Um, uh, it's just been such a great conversation. I am invigorated to go back to work, um, help tell these stories and learn myself. So thank you so much. I wanna thank Paul Fuller, uh, Luke Gates Milardo and Christopher Tim for helping run the show uh, behind the scenes and in front of the camera as well. Um, I think we've learned today that there are more stories to be told, more, vo more voices to be heard, much work to be done. Um, so while this can be daunting, it's important and it's essential. Um, so I welcome all of you to come visit Maine Maritime Museum. Uh, we actually have an upcoming exhibit opening, uh, very closely tied to some of the stories that we told today. Um, it's titled Cotton Town, Maine's Economic Connections to Slavery, and that will be opening up on December 16th. Um, I invite you to come see that. Um, so thank you again for today's rich discussion. If you have further questions or comments, please just uh, email them to Maine Maritime Museum staff. We can get in touch with our speakers um, if you want more information on something you've heard today. Um, and with that, I conclude Maine Maritime Museum's 2021 annual symposium, Unfurl, Symposium for Undertold Maritime Voices. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.